It's a moment. One. All right. So, hello, everybody, and welcome to The Secret History of Living in Your Aquarium with our very special guest, uh, Frank uh, Magalanis. Is that how you say it? Magalanis? <laughs> Magallanes. Magallanes. Sorry about go. that. <laughs> let me let me let me quiet this this one thing over here and then we'll be good to go on all the multimedia stuff uh, all right okay so welcome uh welcome thank you so much for your time and for uh coming to join us on the show today uh pretty exciting um so i guess Let's let's start where it starts. So uh, you're Frank, and how did you get into piranhas, or, or what sparked your interest? Well, I was a little whippersnapper I was in 1958, which is a long time ago for most people. <laughs> uh, and my father uh, was always reading the Sunday newspaper, and I went over to him to see what he was looking at, and he was watching a comic called The Phantom. The oh, yeah. Box. And uh, in that one series of cartoons there was a uh, uh the phantom was in a boat with his son going to the some place called eden and there was a fish jumping out of the water and he said piranha and uh and i asked my father what that was and he, of course he told me it was a cannibal fish that anybody gets into the water they're immediately eaten so whoa i gotta <laughs> study this fish yeah and that's how i got started in my interest in piranhas <laughs> Wow. And from there, uh, I went to a, uh, in elementary school, we had a, uh, a mobile uh, school library. And I went into the library to look for, you know, anything on piranhas. And I found one book, and it had a picture of, of a, a couple of them in there. And I asked the librarian, the woman that was in charge of it there, uh, if there were any other books. And she told me, why do you want to study that fish? I said, well, they're fascinating. You don't want to study that fish. They are horrible. They eat people. So my advice to you is don't look for any more information on those fish. And I thought, kind of, okay, well, I guess I will then. And uh, Yeah, as I just a kid, that's, going, that's going, you know? right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I just kept going and looking for more material. And, and I hit the libraries uh, anywhere I could uh, and in Oxnard, which was basically one library. And I went in there and I just went through all the cards looking for anything on piranhas and everything that I found, I'd write it up, keep notes to myself. And eventually uh, I walked into a pet store, the only one in town at that time. And uh, I asked the owner if he had any piranhas. Well, he sold me one, except it was an Oscar. And I didn't know <laughs> it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're mean, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so so I grew that thing for about a year. And I said, well, wait a minute. This is no piranha. <laughs> so, <laughs> I went back in there. Unfortunately, they, they had a new owner. And uh, he had just gotten a new supply of books. And I found a 1964 book by uh, Harold Schultz called Piranhas. And I looked into it and I bought the book. It was like something like 50 cents. I bought the book and I studied the whole thing. It was in there. And then eventually he got some in his aquarium. At that time in California, uh, it wasn't quite illegal to possess them yet, but it was headed that way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was able to get several small babies, uh, piranhas that they had for sale. And I actually gave up my school lunches uh, to buy them. And of course I didn't tell my mother at the time, that's what I was doing with the money. But I was saving all my money for my school lunches to buy a one single piranha at the astronomical price of $4.99. So, <laughs> is this the 1960s then, or yeah, 1960s. okay, right? And so my first uh, introduction was with uh, Phygocentris natarite, and I uh, ah. and I grew that one, and eventually I bought a uh, Phygo. That's the Picana. that's the red belly, the red belly, and and the gold belly. Okay, yeah. and I bought one of those, and um, and I just took off, you know, just learned from them, watched them, put them outside in an outdoor pond, see if they'd survive out there. Did all kinds oh. of different things with them. <laughs> what city were you in at the time? In Oxnard. Okay. No. Yeah, yeah. So did they survive outdoor. in a... No, no. I, okay. I, in fact, the pond that I'm talking about is actually an enclosed pond, not out in the pond pond. Uh, mm -hmm. I, was, I was not stupid. I, I kept them where I could study them. And I put uh -huh. them in, the, in a pond, and uh, they usually either killed over or started to die at about 56, 57 degrees. And I wrote all this up. And after I gathered all that information up, I sent it to the local Fish and Wildlife Office. 
<laughs> and I got a and I got a really really stern letter that I wasn't supposed to have these fish and and that uh, that I should destroy them and uh, that the ODFW was not or not ODFW but uh, California Fish and Wildlife was not interested in the studies of these fish. So that, okay, you know. <laughs> It, it's interesting how fear uh, prevents us from learning so much about yeah. so many things, whether it's, you know, m mushrooms or, you know, just we don't even learn about like, oh, there might be some deadly ones. Well, I'm not going to learn about them, you know. Yeah. Uh, so with fish, it's the same thing. But that's that, you know, that's what's interesting to me is when you look at the list of states where they're illegal, a lot of them, the piranha would never survive. I mean, Washington, for instance. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cool. Um, I think it's are in Washington. Yeah, yeah. My dad had them when he was a, a teenager, I know, um, yeah. in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s. So were they being um, – you mentioned uh, Schultz, uh, and that's the guy that the Corridora is named after. And that yeah. uh, we got, So if people in the chat are, um, you know, hearing some of these names, it's – I always like to point out, since uh, I like to look at the history of things on the channel, you know, the the people that that educated the people who are educating us now you know and and that legacy of how we name things and how this information gets passed on it's years and years of hard work and people like yourself that uh you know just take the time to note well you know and you have to kill a lot of fish sometimes accidentally to know the right thing you know and yeah. then it saves fish in the future though so yeah, that's true. That's um true. People get discouraged sometimes when they're trying to breed stuff, and I always try to point out that you know the the biggest experts are some of the biggest fish accidental murderers out there in, in the course of their life. But well, you know, uh, a lot of people don't realize that with the piranhas, uh, from from the very first one that dis that was described to to all the way up until I would venture the eighteen uh, hundreds. They were all some other field. They were either botanists or they were anthropologists or they were some other bizarre science. And they, they were doing all these different descriptions and stuff with the fish. Yeah. So um, for one moment, I'd just like to say hi to, you know, folks like Ivan and, uh, you know, Ginger. We've got lots of great people in the chat. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, at the end, we'll have time for question and answers. So just hold your questions for that. But, um, you know, Back to uh, speaking on the the notion of why we fear these fish, uh, why they had such a reputation that you saw in the old Tarzan movies and you see in uh, old B-grade, you know, horror movies that, you know, they turn people into a skeleton in a second or whatever, you know. Um, you know, a lot of that seems to come from Teddy Roosevelt's account uh, in the U.S. anyhow. So I was wondering if you wanted to speak on that incident a little bit. Well, the year was 1917. The book was Into the Brazilian Wilderness. And it's basically uh, Roosevelt exploring parts of South America, looking for adventures, bringing his little bit of entourage of newspaper reporters with him. And, right. uh, uh, and without putting him down, I mean, they did suffer a lot of bad stuff happening to them, you know, from malaria to other, other injuries and stuff. But when it came to the piranha, the Brazilians at that time, took him to a river for him to do, uh, to discover, which was later named the Rio Roosevelt or something like that. But anyway, <laughs> they had branched off a couple portions of that river and filled it full of piranhas uh, about a couple <laughs> weeks before Roosevelt was to arrive to discover it. And one of the things that they told him was, you don't want to enter that river because there are some very deadly fish in there. And of course, Roosevelt had never heard of the piranha at that time. And he says, what do you mean? He said, yes, this is a deadly piranha that they will attack you they will eat you and devour you turning you into skeletons within moments and of course roosevelt yeah i don't believe that prove it but anyway they put a cow in there and of course the cow was bleeding the piranhas attacked the newspapers took, took it all down photographed it and they and they said it's true this is the deadly piranha and this is how the uh the american people learned about them and learned to fear them since then it's interesting how something a hundred over a hundred years ago now has still cast that, you know, I mean, and, and um, I feel like now the myth has gone almost the other way where people try to tell you, you know what, they're actually a harmless fish, which isn't quite the case either. You know, they, they've no, got teeth. No. <laughs> no. So, um, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, it's kind of funny too, because he, he went all over Africa and 
you know, if it was big and it had teeth, he would kill it or it make a story about, you know, the triumph man over beast kind of or thing. <laughs> or yeah, or name it after himself. That's right. I mean, the teddy bear is named after uh, him in our culture. Yeah. So, it, it, yeah, it's an interesting thing about how a, a charismatic one person, I mean, they can do good things, they can do bad things, but regardless, they can actually change uh, the course of how we interpret things in our society, you know, for a long time. That's true. That's true. And so cor correcting that to a more accurate uh, assessment of the piranha seems to be kind of your life's uh, fascination work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, well, basically they are potentially dangerous. That's the word that I like to use. Potentially, mm -hmm. dangerous. potentially dangerous, meaning that if you have a cut on your hand or some bleeding part of you and you go into the, to the water, where uh, the piranhas are at, chances are you likely will not get bit unless you go further into the water. Uh, for example, uh, let's say you were swimming in the water, you had a cut or bleed, then you probably would get bit. Yeah, I'm not saying attacked, but bit. Where you are uh, having the potential of being attacked and really in bad shape is when, for example, uh, let's say uh, there's an area where fishermen have to clean fish regularly. Oh, Those yeah. areas are very, very dangerous. You don't want to go into the water there because the piranhas have a, as a, associated anything dropping into the water as, as a food. So, so your chances are you would be attacked by them. Okay. But just going on in the other part of the river, you know, you're not going to, uh, very unlikely you're going to get bit. In fact, uh, you may have to worry more about this guy than, than anything else. That's, that's a candido. Candido? Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they get into every orifice, if you know what I mean. Is, uh, Ow. <laughs> yes. So if, if people are watching and don't know about that fish, uh, yes, it's feared by the locals more than most, I think. Uh, <laughs> when you relieve yourself in, in the river, uh, you must be careful that there are none near uh, uh, following the warmth uh, of things. So, yeah, uh, yeah. needless to say, there are medical... Yeah, there are medical, uh, there is medical proof that I have read and seen that that yeah. is not a, a myth either. So yeah, those nasty, that would be a nasty occasion to happen. Yeah, it's funny, you've got one handy. That's <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, not a, a handy, I have a few little specimens over here to, to show off and we need to look at them. But, that's, uh, yeah, the, kind of, the, kind of, the Kindido is kind of a neat little, little, little guy, little, and put that up there so people can see it. Oh yeah, yeah. So I know in your in your time you've collected a lot of specimens uh, of different fish and jaws and teeth and things. So how many different uh, piranha are there uh, in the group that we recognize currently? I know you've got about maybe 16 on your website that are yet to be described and different, but yeah. but like how many do we recognize currently? Okay. Right, right now currently. Uh... And I have to differentiate a little bit between what the scientists consider valid and what I consider valid. Uh, sure. So let me let me make that right there, okay. The valid ones that I know of, there are at least, uh, uh, I believe, 32 Sarah Salmon species and uh, uh, four, five, 35 altogether and three pygocentris and one denticulata. So okay. we're talking about 35, 40. About 42 species, roughly. Sure. Yeah, I'm doing my math right. Yeah, yeah. and is the uh, taxonomy on that, has that been done through dentition? Like the, the, the teeth is what makes them a piranha or, <laughs> or I mean? No, no. Uh, the, the entire fish is described. They, they use uh, different methods of, of morphology counts where, they, where they, they do a, uh, a scan of the fish and they count the number of bones that are there, uh, the number of, of, of teeth. Uh, any other unusual markings that the fish has that might uh, be described as a different species. But today we're also into the DNA, which is totally new field that's just exploding right. uh, what we once thought. You know, so, uh, but right now I can I can safely say there's at least 35 species of Pidania, 40 okay. at the most. Uh, uh, but science recognizes around 60 altogether from old scientific names that are probably have long disappeared. Right. And so do you do you believe that, you know, I've talked to Ivan 
quite a bit. And when he was on the show, he spoke of, you know, the Southern Orinoco being kind of a unexplored no man's land almost of, of, of fish compared to a lot of busy spots in the Amazon and at river deltas where there's cities and things. So do you, I mean, potentially, do you, do you have any guesstimate or thoughts on, you know, do you think we only know half of them or do you think that there's uh, we know most of them? I mean, any sense of that at all? Well, I believe, it's hard to know, obviously. Yeah, it, it is hard to know. I, I believe there's at least 10 undescribed species in Peru. For Venezuela, I'm not certain. There may be one, maybe two more out there. I, I, I couldn't tell you for sure. Until yeah. Until it's actually explored. And, and so do they seem to speciate? I mean, I, I've noticed that in some rivers, there's up to eight or nine species in the same river. Uh, in the Amazon, it looked like, um, but most they speciate to their own river, right? Yeah, most do. Yeah, most do. I say most do. The problem that we're having today is uh, people's thoughtful or uh, lack of thoughtfulness that they're actually introducing fish that don't belong there anymore. You know. Uh, oh, sure. So, so we're that finding, like, for example, like Branta. Branta used to be limited to. Uh, to the uh, San Francisco, you know, and some of its tributaries, but now they're being found elsewhere, outside okay. of, that, of that range. And the same thing with uh, uh, Maculatus. Uh, I think uh, Pago, uh, Pago Centris Pirea is another one that's uh, being found in, in another portion of the river where it was never found before that was introduced. So that's, that's causing a problem, yes. Wow, okay. Yeah, I mean, people think about, uh, you know, fish being caught and kept in aquariums in the developed world and whatnot. But I mean, people keep fish all over the world. So uh, they get released also in the Amazon, you know, by people too, or by fishermen who maybe they caught too many and they've got them live in a tank, you know, in a holding tank and they were going to try to sell them to a trader or to a market and they can't get what they wanted. So they just dump them in the river, you know, um, after, after traveling with a motorboat. Yeah. So uh, that's interesting. So I want to get back to you again uh, as we kind of go through this, you know, story of the fish, story of you. Uh, So what after you became fascinated and you got some and and you uh, raised them, kept notes and things, what was kind of your next step in the hobby and say like the 70s or how did it progress for you? uh, You know, how did you go from just keeping a couple to uh collecting artifacts of them and and getting into taxonomy type stuff and things well I, like i said it was kind of a it became a, a natural love affair with the fish mm-hmm. the more I, I found out about them the more attracted i became to them and and wanted to, to learn and uh what, what happened from there is that i went to uh, when i went to the to the uh, universities I, I tried to to look at a lot of the collections that they had there and, uh, and, and fortunately, I, I was able to get into a couple of them and look at some of the fish that they had on, on um, in the bottles. And uh, when I went to Oregon State, uh, this was just before I got into the uh, the legislative battle on the on the species. I took a yeah. lot of the specimens that I had saved over the years and collected. I took it to them and donated it to them uh, because I understood much of a collection on piranhas. Right? And uh, when I went into the lab, there was an aquarium uh, with an Oscar and a, and, a, and a red belly together, you know. And I asked, at that time with Professor Markle, I asked him, hey, Doug, what's, what's with this? And he said that this was a fish that, that somebody had donated to the university. And, and they had an Oscar and they just put them together and they had been there for years, which is really remarkable uh, to me. You know, I thought it was pretty neat. But um, getting back to what you originally asked, um, after learning as much as I could, uh, I thought, well, I need to do a legislative thing to get them legalized in Oregon because I had moved here in 1992 and I wanted to, you know, possess them legally. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, can you move to Washington next? No, I was going to move up to Washington <laughs> State. Uh, I actually, boy, this is gonna we gotta go around circles here. Uh, I was in the military back in the 70s, and I was stationed at, at uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, mm-hmm. and I still collected piranhas while I was still in the military, you know. And from there, I went to, to Germany, and uh, I tried to find piranhas there, but they were illegal during, I guess, the present government that was there, that, that was still standing. So I couldn't find any except in, a, in the Wilhelm Zoo, 
where at which I visited frequently and, and saw the red bellies they had in there. And, uh, but, uh, I'm getting lost here. So anyway, after, after, uh, the Wilhelm Zoo, I went back to the United States, uh, and, uh, I started collecting piranhas again. And, uh, after I got out of the military in uh, 1985, I moved again to California, started collecting piranhas again, and all the little back shops and alleys got them, got them yeah. picked up quite a few. And then I moved to, to Oregon in 1992, and then somebody had had, uh, had called in Fish and Wildlife and told them that I had a piranha in my possession. So that brought the state troopers to my home. Oh, boy. <laughs> that wasn't all that bad. Anyway, they asked me, uh, sir, we got a report that you have some piranhas here. I said, yes, I do. You admit it? Yeah, sure. You want to come in and see them? <laughs> so I took the state troopers into into the house, to the room where I had them. And he said, well, these don't look like the kind that, that we normally get from people. I said, well, no, these are two different varieties of piranha. This is Cerasalmus rhombius. This is Pygocentrus nataris. Or this is your true piranha over here. These are not piranha. These are pirambibas. So they kind of look kind of mystified. And he said, do, do you know a lot about these fish? Yeah, I've studied them most of my life. So uh, what they suggested was that I go ahead and contact a local state representative and see if I could get them legalized in Oregon so I wouldn't come under trouble with the law. So I said, wow. I can do that. So they left the fish with me until it was my time to go to court, which was in 1993 or four, or three, I think it was. But what anyway, great cop. <laughs> I went to court. What's that? I said, what great cops. What I said, what great cops those were for you. Yeah, yeah, they were pretty good. Yeah, the state troopers, I mean, the state troopers at that time were, were pretty good. Uh, and they were really compassionate, believe it or not. Yeah. They got a lot of trouble, too, for, for letting me keep the thing. But anyway, I, I went to the courts, and uh, my, my attorney was Charles Lee, and I went up against uh, 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 Fish and Wildlife and his, and his attorney, and the court hearing lasted about an hour, and the judge returned the pirambibas to me, and the, the natarai was confiscated and sent back to ODFW with the agreement that the fish would wind up at the Steinhardt Aquarium. And unbeknownst to the ODFW, I was friends with the biologist from the Steinhardt Aquarium. So I checked up on the fish about a month later to see how it was doing, and it turned out the fish never got there. ODFW had killed it en route before getting to the airport and the biologist had his uh his people waiting at the airport for the fish to be picked up and and he wasted an entire day there waiting at the airport for the fish and never showed up so yeah. me being me i called frank up his name is frank glenn and i asked hey frank what happened to the fish and he said well we had my guy out there we never got it i don't know what happened to it I said, okay thanks i'll call odfw and so I called ODFW, which was Dave Loomis. He was the biologist in charge of that fish. And uh, I asked, what happened to my fish? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it died in transit. And me, I exploded. I got mad. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I told him off in so many words, you know. And, uh, and I told him, I will never forget your name, and I will never forget what you did to my fish. And so uh, I contacted State Representative Bill Fisher, and I asked, and I told him about the story of what had happened. And I told him, I looked at the Oregon legislature, uh, the, the laws that prohibited piranhas, and they were the, the law itself was vague and unenforceable. And, uh, <laughs> and I told him, okay. And so from there, we got into a face to face contact, and he introduced legislation to, to remove the ban on piranhas. And so that required me to go to the House Natural Resources Committee and confront none other than Kate Brown, who is now the Oregon governor. But at that time, she was a lawyer for the uh, Fish and Wildlife. So I went in with just my brain, nothing else, and sat down and I gave everybody, the legislature, a lecture on what piranhas were, how many there were, and so on and so forth. And Kate Brown started her, her, uh, her uh, testimony with, let's talk about goldfish and how they have uh, been transplanted in Oregon. And I kind of look at a goldfish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened was I, I gave the majority of the testimony, and she kind of looked at me, and she said, well, I defer to Mr. Magallanes to give more information on piranhas. You know? so, 
<laughs> so, so by the time it was all over, Bill Fisher had told the committee, you know, Frank Magallanes is about the only person in the world that can walk in here without a stitch of paper on him and give a full testimony on Piranius. <laughs> and, and I want to applaud him. <laughs> so, so by the time I got out of there, I had all kinds of newspaper people there and they, they, they asked me if they could see my notes. I said, I don't have any notes. <laughs> <laughs> so they they tried a second time about two years later to get them banned and this time i sent a couple friends to go up there and i had them take a a, a paper that was uh uh published by the american fishery society that did a research paper on on natterite surviving cold weather in in the united yeah. states and of course the paper said they can't survive anything above this this point here in the, in the u.s in the continental u.s so um uh Needless to say, they, they kicked out her request to try to get them banned again, and Birinus became officially legalized in 1995. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, and that's, for anybody watching, I mean, that's that's a lesson in that we can change the law. I mean, yeah, es yeah. especially obscure laws. I mean, to most people, they don't care one way or another about that law, and then the people who do care are either ill-informed or they're on your side uh, because science is on our side, you know, with – with especially in Washington or you know um, the northeast of the United States or Minnesota or something, you know. You know, I, I looked at Washington's law and and their and their basis for uh, prohibiting piranha is not based on science. The, the names are completely wrong. And it's not even based on science. Yeah, you know, uh, they did that. They did that with the crayfish too. They literally banned them all. Like, yeah. they're, except for the the native ones, which you can't have in captivity. The other ones are all banned. They literally just took the genus and banned everything based well, on no, nothing. Well, you know, we had one after the law was approved here in Oregon. We had one or two instances of where somebody threw out a piranha in, into one of the local, uh, local lakes. I believe it was up in Portland. Mm -hmm. And it was caught. It was fished out. And Fish and Wildlife uh, made a, I guess, either made or filed a complaint about it being, you know, caught. And they got, and Fish, or, Representative Fisher got in contact with me, and by that he was he was a state senator. He said, "Well, Fish and Wildlife uh, said that they caught a piranha up on up in Portland." And I said, "Okay, did they catch it and kill it?" I said, "Yeah, okay, well it's been managed." So he went back and told them it's been managed. <laughs> well, you know, I, I recall uh, I've got three different cases I dug up before we we were chatting today, where there's one in Green Lake, is a, a lake in Seattle, where they pulled out a piranha. But it was a Paku, uh, by the photo, very obviously. Yeah. Um, and then two cases, one in Spokane and one in another spot. But they were all in summer and um, in very small lakes with heavy fishermen right. uh, activity. Um, nothing has ever been found of babies or more than one in a single lake. Um, so, I, I mean... I, as far as, you know, advocating them being legalized in more places, uh, you said, did you say 57 degrees or so is about where they well, can't they survive, to, period? Well, they, they begin to you know, turn their, their life support system off. They actually mm -hmm. become uh, mortally dead at, at 47, 47, 48, somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. So any place that has a, a, a winter that freezes is just automatically yeah. not good for place for them okay well that's you know that that's just interesting to know too now do you know of any cases just to play devil's advocate where they've survived and say like you know a power plant runoff or is there any even any documentation of that happening anywhere the only place where there actually has a recorded population it was in florida which makes sense yeah yeah uh, they, had a, they had a place called monkey land and it was in 1977 i believe they found a population of uh, a Cerasalmus rhombaeus that was left in a in a man-made uh, <coughs> excuse me man-made pond. I got to take a pop drop. Yeah, it's okay. Pond. And uh, they had a man-made pond there, and they found a breeding population in there, and uh, which wow. which the Fish and Wildlife destroyed. At that time, they were identified as uh, Cerasalmus humoralis, and my mentor, who later became my mentor, uh, uh, William Fink from the University of Michigan properly identified them. Oh, wow. Yeah, so. so as far as um, reproduction goes then, did you, have you bred these fish then? 
Uh, yeah, I bred, I bred them once back in the '70s, uh, Natterite, which is okay. fairly common for for most you know people that get involved with the species. That's the one that's most commonly bred. And later in 2004 or five, I bred uh, Cerasalmon maculatus. Oh wow! Which is, which is another one that's predisposed to spawn in the aquarium. So, so there is a population in the black market or open market, depending on the state, where people don't have to import them, where they're they're sustained yeah. through breeding. Okay, right, right. At, le at least those two. Uh, mm -hmm. From what I understand, uh, people have been getting uh, better at it. We've, and I know now that we're getting some homebred species of Cerasalmus uh, uh, manii, and I believe in Germany they were breeding Cerasalmus and cherryi. Oh. Okay. Very getting, cool. Yeah, they're getting there. So now I guess another thing is if someone were to go out to uh, in a, whatever, a pet shop and, and they're legal there or not or whatever, but they, they see these fish, what would they need to know about care? I mean, could you put it in a 40 gallon? You know, like what, you know, what should, what would you tell someone if they see this little fish, you know, or, you know, whatever, silver dollar size, if they're young or whatever, um, how big can these species get? What, I mean, what kind of food and budget for food do you have to have ready? Um, what would you tell them for preparing properly? Okay. First and foremost, I would tell them, do not mishandle it. <laughs> they can be small, but they can bite you. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I had a two and a half inch specimen actually, uh, I needed stitches on after he bit me on the finger. Wow. So you don't, you first foremost. Do not mishandle it. Second of all, uh, for example, uh, natterite, you, you need a, for a single specimen, you need at least a 40 gallon aquarium. Okay. And if you're going to go beyond that, then you're talking between 150 to 200 gallons for anything more. So sure. it's not, because they grow, they can grow up to 10 to 12 inches in the, in the home aquarium at the most. Um, you know, I've seen some larger ones in the public aquariums, but, but generally, ten to twelve inches is the maximum growth in the home aquarium. But they, are, they're as far as yeah. They also get tall as well, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they get a little bit high back. It depends. It depends on which species you're dealing with. Uh, but getting back to natterite, um, a forty gallon for a single specimen. Uh, as far as the budgeting of food, I don't recommend you use live food for one specific reason. They can introduce parasites or diseases into mm. the aquarium. And mm -hmm. also certain species like uh, like goldfish can, they produce a hormone called a, a thymonins, which can actually inhibit the growth of a fish if you get too many oh. of that. Okay, yeah. So you have to be careful with that. Uh, it, what was the rest of your questions that you asked? Oh, so, uh, I mean, do they like living alone? Do they like a group? I mean, they're always shown in groups in the wild, uh, you know. Uh, well, to so be honest with you, I've never seen a sad <laughs> right now. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, generally, uh, natteri you can you can put them together for four to six specimens, depending on how large the aquarium is. I guess okay, we're talking about 100 to 150 gallon aquarium. Uh, you can keep them together, but you have to be very careful not to have the water temperature too high, because anything above 77 degrees, it, it, it causes them to become more agitated and and more more uh, aggressive. So you want to keep the, the temperatures at, at much cooler than, than that. Okay, so, in, in, interesting. Like 72, 74, like where would you uh, recommend? For, for Natterite, I would recommend 74 to 77 at, at the most. Okay. Uh, certain species like Cariba, for example, Pagocentric Cariba from Venezuela, those fish are highly aggressive at higher temperatures. And you will have almost cannibalism almost instantly if you, give, if you put them in temperatures above 78 degrees. So wow. you want to keep them a little bit cooler in the, in the aquarium. Because uh, this way, uh, their their aggression kind of tones down a little bit. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so fish being essentially cold blooded, most of them. Uh, I'll just say that broadly. It's not quite true, but um, the their their metabolism goes faster when when it's warm. And right. so, is is it because that they're they're seeking food more voraciously, more, and they're able to move faster and things that. They get that agitated when it's warm water, or I think I think it's I think the metallic gets triggered because uh, during the summer months the temperature of course is higher. Okay. During the dry season, and so they're they're wanting to eat more, um, and of course they want to also mate. Uh, yeah. At higher temperatures, 
so you have those two two things working there you know against each other and plus the fact that, that they're in an aquarium in a closed system they have nowhere to escape so if one gets you know aggressive with the other you know they're, they're trapped yeah so uh is there any parental care are they egg scatters what is what does reproduction look like for them okay for generally speaking because we don't know about all of them sure generally yeah speaking like natari Bidea, uh, maculatas these are and probably jerry they all build nests they all guard their eggs wow so they it, to me that demonstrates a level of intelligence memory um and I think a lot of a lot of uh, cichlids, a lot of you know fish that either protect their babies or that um, build a nest to attract mates and things. I mean, they collect certain rocks or they move the sand in certain ways. I mean, you just see this behavior in lots of species. So I always just like to um, take a moment of pause, also just for the sake of being kind to these animals, to enclose them properly in a big enough tank and. Um, you know, not to put them in a situation where they're agitated um, because they they are creatures that are not just heartless killing machines. I mean, they they they're they're creatures. They're they're sentient little creatures. Well, you know, most of most of the attacks on humans. Just getting back to that a little bit. Yeah, most of the attacks on humans is from they're disturbing the nests because there's yeah. been a lot of man-made uh, intrusion. And uh, some of the areas have been have been uh, uh, basically dammed off, where they create these extra little ponds and stuff. And the fish always go to the shallows to, to lay their eggs. And when you have people walk in there, you know, say, "Hey, I want to take a bath," or, or, or yeah. whatever you're going to do, they're going to get bit because they're protecting the brood. So that's why you get the ankle uh, lacerations right. as the most right. common. Off toe, whatever you know. You yeah. Know. So, so um, evolutionarily. What what is their place in in the Amazon, the Orinoco? Like, are they an apex predator? Are they a? I mean, are they hunted? What what is their status? You know, they're a food fish. Uh, they they feed yeah. other fishes. You know, they, yeah. They feed the birds. They feed the the mammals. You know, and of course they feed humans. Yes. Uh, and certain uh, populated from talking to Ivan, he told me in certain areas in Venezuela, this is basically their staple. This is their food that they eat. So I wouldn't call it an apex predator. I mean, no, I would call yeah. it an indicator species because if sure. the water goes bad, they're, they're usually the first ones to die off, you know. So so do a lot die then in the dry season as they yeah. get stuck in shallow areas and that kind of thing? Yeah. So, they, they, so they're fertilizing the forest then as well and part of that whole uh, – yeah, They're fertilizing, but they're also providing sustenance to the, to the other animals that are there, alligators, caiman, for example, sure. birds. Anything that, that walks, you know, we'll, we'll see that fish in there and they'll, they'll eat it. You know, it's just, yeah. just human. That's just a cycle of life. Yeah. So, I mean, that's much the same as, you know, salmon are here in the Northwest in that their carcasses are food. And they're uh, also, I mean, the very like things it. that they eat, eat them once it's time, you know, uh, in, in a lot of ways. Nutrients, so. you know? mm-hmm. nutrients. And, and that being yeah. in the Amazon, which is very uh, nutrient poor as a general rule and phosphates and things like that very low in the soil for uh, agricultural re- purposes, unless you're at the mouth of the rivers, kind of. So uh, I bet, I mean, I, I, so I'm an anthropology and history, archaeology major. Um, and I re- recall that uh, the piranhas and other fish were also used as uh they throw them in their gardens uh sure. as compost basically i used to uh, do the same thing too uh, <laughs> yeah i mean we, whatever we catch too many a uh, uh, certain fish we just use it for for compost you know and, sure and fertilizer is great i used to have some beautiful plants growing whenever i would do a, a water change i should yes. the water out to the garden and boom i'd get the beautiful flowers sure sure so our uh, what kind of water conditions do piranha uh, and you know? Sorry, you you pronounce it beautifully. I have the the <laughs> most anglicized American butchering of it. But how do you, how do we? Uh, I, or what kind of water do they live in? Is it neutral pH? Is it acidic? Um, black water or white water? I mean, is it does it range? Well, they're not. They're not. They're rarely found in black water. Most most of them is is towards the neutral. Um, okay. It depends on the species and, and where they are 
Now, because some of the, the pH may be a little bit uh, lower and some could be a little bit higher, but generally you try to shoot for a neutral pH in the aquarium, you know, but okay. generally uh, I, I think uh, uh, Ivan may have to correct me on this, but I think uh, Cadio Spinus was found in a little bit of a darker water. Um, I'm not sure exactly if, it, if it's uh, what the pH values are on that. He could probably tell you. I don't, sure. I don't really know. Sure. I'm sure folks can look it up for each species too, if they're curious, you know? Um, so, so then I want to talk about also your incredible work with the Oregon, the, the Institute that you bait or business. I mean, how, how, how would you categorize? I'll let you explain. Okay. I'll just stop okay. <laughs> bumbling and I'll, and I'd, I'd like to hear about this, this project that you started in 94, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, O-P-E-F-E, -E, which, which is an acronym for Oregon Piranha Exotic Fish Exhibit. I originally uh, created that exhibit uh, based on one sole specimen at that time. And um, I wanted the public to, to learn about them, um, uh, to realize, you know, teach them that they're not this horrible monster that yeah. they've been afraid to be. And from that, I, I built it up on a 17-foot picture window. I laid out, layered out all kinds of aquariums in front of that picture window, and uh, I started advertising. And I was actually getting, like, and I couldn't believe it. it. It actually took off so well. But I started getting busloads of people that would come from all different parts of Oregon, and I've had the people come as far as Mexico and, and the United Kingdom to come visit that exhibit. Wow! Eventually, it got so big that I decided, well, I better use a room instead. So I had a free back room. And I converted it into nothing but aquariums, wall to wall, as high as I could put them up, uh, with a with a center row and down the middle of the room. And it was at that time that National Geographic came to my home and wanted to do a a, a videotape doc, mini documentary called Urban Piranhas. Ninety eight was that ninety ninety eight or so? I believe it was ninety eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so they came to my home in, in Sutherland, Oregon, and. Uh, uh, they videotaped uh, the exhibit, and of course, they asked me the same kind of questions that you just did. Sure. Uh, and it, eventually, it aired on uh, on the National Geographic Channel, and and uh, from there, in 2000, um, it, it was getting to be where I couldn't really do anything more with it, and uh, so a, a website was created, which I eventually took over and did it myself because I. Did really and nothing against the person, but she was trying to learn how to do website. wasn't doing very good at it, <laughs> so I took it over and decided to do it myself. And it became what it became today. You know, it was basically an archive of everything that's Piranha in there. Yeah. So that website, um, I'll link it in the description. Um, you know, the the other thing that I want to talk about, and we'll get there eventually, is that this life's work that you've done. We're actually, or you, you and other experts and people like Ivan are working on putting together a book on all of this information. Um, and so there's a link uh, that people can sign up for uh, that's in the description now. And I believe uh, right now it's pinned at the top of the chat. Uh, and you guys can uh, go there and it'll keep you up to date with the progress of that book when it comes out and all that. Um, so, I mean, this book is, is I've noticed there's a real shortage of, there's lots of books on piranhas for kids and, you know, like yeah. cutesy little stories. And um, there's one or two on keeping red bellies that are kind of thin books on maybe um, how to keep them. They look like more like pamphlets. So, I mean, are there any books you would recommend already? Or, I mean, it seems like you're working on kind of the definitive book that there will be well we, there were two books that were published both by a friend of mine uh david schlesser okay uh, uh the there was the piranhas the uh pet owner's manual the first one he did um he did it on his own basically and then he found out about me and then i helped him with the second one so, <laughs> so the second one actually became the bible that's that it is today for the the fish keepers that are interested in piranhas and, and what's the name of that book one more time? It's, it's Piranhas, the Pet Owner's Manual uh, by okay. David F. Schlesser. Okay. And and I basically helped him with that one. And uh, we had actually, there's some photos from my own ex exhibit fish are, are in that book, as well as many hobbyists that came out to help. I mean, I couldn't believe the amount of help that we got from hobbyists. They were really great. And I'm, I'm really, I, I would be 
remiss if I didn't, you know, mention them because they were tremendous in getting this book put together on that on that little pamphlet that he that it was published. And that's something I I mean I can't speak highly enough is that you don't need a PhD, you don't need this doctorate necessarily, or to be from a university to contribute to real science to real uh, you know uh, education going forward of fish. Science can't keep up with whether it's funding or it's just there's so many things going on. They've never been able to keep up with the hobby as far as new fish being discovered and learning to, you know, reproduce fish in captivity. And so a lot of times the cutting edge is hobbyists. And so I want to, you know, empower listeners, viewers, um, if, if there's a fish you love, if there's uh, something or plants or whatever it is in the hobby that you're into, um, and you're having success with this, um, document it, share it. Uh, you know, it's an invaluable information for us. And if you keep piranhas and you're listening to this and you haven't yet, uh, gotten to know Frank or, uh, Ivan, I, I mean, drop them a line. And if you've got great photos of your fish or, you know, you've been spawning them or something, maybe, uh, you know, you might be able to contribute to some of the information. So, uh, you know, Frank is the walking encyclopedia as it is, but, uh, but, uh, th you know, there's always things out there if someone spreads worth. something. Yeah. 60 years worth. 60 years of piranha obsession. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So. We, you know, it was as we're, we got on talking about the book, um, and this, this is uh, something that's very personal to me. The, yeah. The, most people don't know this. I mean, Alexander just found this out, but. I, I wrote the entire book that's being uh, right now in the works. I did. I wrote the majority of it while I was going through dialysis. I've been in dialysis since October of last year for kidney failure. And dialysis is basically keeping me and a bunch of other people that are with me alive. Uh, and, uh, and I can tell you, in, in, in all honesty, this book, my love went into it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it was kind of... It was funny. I mean, it's funny now. It wasn't funny at the time, but when I was writing it, I was hooked up, and, and I would be talking into my phone, voice dic doing voice diction, writing the, the book, and the nurses would walk by me, and they said, Frank, what are you doing? <laughs> they would say, piranha this, piranha that. <laughs> and, I, and I finally told them that I'm writing a book. They said, oh, well, I want a copy of it as soon as you get it. So you'll get a copy. Don't worry. <laughs> so you, you know, thank you for mentioning that. Um I, a lot of people are, there's a stigma talking about stigmas. There's a stigma on people who are sick or um, disabled or have chronic, whatever it may be, issues, disease, illness. Um, and our hobby of fish keeping is one that can invigorate and still be done to a large degree, sometimes with a little help, sometimes with a lot of help. But um it's why I love our hobby too. But I mean, thank you for, for letting us know something so personal, but also that the fact that, I mean, this is kind of your, your magnum opus of, of uh, a life of 60 years of, of getting this down on paper. I mean, you've got specific photos on the website and things where it's down to the point, you know, a 10th of a millimeter, uh, the, the length of the lower dentition of, obscure species of piranhas and things yeah. um I, I, the the photography in there of uh, specimens and things is just great and uh, whatnot um and so i'm sure the book will be incredible i mean i'm 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 kind of a, a fly on the wall to you guys creating the book right now I, i'm i i know nothing about piranha other than what i you know can read online and hear from you guys so I, I'm no authority to speak on keeping them or anything. So I, I really value your time and, and the fact that you spoke with us today and everything, you know, I appreciate that. Well, I just want to, I just want to tell everyone, those that are, that have some type of illness, you know, don't, don't give up, you know, just, just do the good fight, you know, uh, continue to accomplish what you can accomplish in life. <clears throat> and, uh, I mean, every day I wear a little tag here, you know, don't don't stick needles and stuff inside of me, you know, but on this arm. But, you know, the purpose of that is, is, is for, to me, I kind of wear like a badge of honor. Sure. Yeah. And, and I want people to understand that 
yes, I'm going through dialysis. Yes, it, it causes me physical problems, you know, throughout the, you know, I don't get to travel anymore like I used to. I'm kind of basically a stay at home now and have been for almost a year. But aside from all of that, that doesn't mean that I can't still work. And I, and I still work. And I still yeah. got a brain that, that still functions. And, and I try to reach out to reach out to as many people as I can to try to help them uh, study, learn the studies. I, I don't know how many people that have that have come into my life and thanked me because they've they found ichthyology a, a worthwhile topic to take, you know, or or just simple biology. And sure. for me, for me, that that really gets to my heart, the very heart of me, you know, and, and and how grateful I am that that I've been able to help people. And and that's really what it's all about, you know. Just yeah. Kind of, Learn as much as you can about pediatrics. Don't be afraid of them, you know. But be, you know, just be cautious. Well, we stand on the shoulder of giants, as they say. Uh, you know, every generation we learn a little bit more, and when we pass that on, we amplify. You know, the energy that that you've put your sixty years into. We can learn by reading a book in a few days what took 60 years of work. And I think people undervalue that oftentimes too. So, uh, you know, thank you for doing that, obviously. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about before we go, because a lot of people, I see people asking, do you know uh, George Fear? Do you know so-and-so? Do you know? Uh, so I just was, I wanted to he hear, I, I happened to overhear or find out a little anecdote about, uh, you being uh, consulting, you know, in Hollywood or, or TV shows and things, um, yeah. and Vegas shows, Penn and Teller's magic show. So I was yeah. wondering if you wanted to speak on any of, uh, if you wanted to give us a little anecdote of uh, your work with any of that uh, before well, we get to some questions from the audience. Well, for example, like the teeth that you were showing, those were from, uh, originally the Hoff Productions contacted me. I guess they were going to use the jaws for several tv shows i don't know what they were i never never got a notice about them uh, or what shows they were but but it was a hoff productions that contacted me on the pen and teller show they sent me a diagram of a rectangular vertical aquarium that they were going to use for one show and uh, they asked me if, if that would be sufficient to hold x amount of piranhas and i told them ah, maybe 20 maybe 30 at the most and they asked me where i could get them the piranhas they will check with the uh, <laughs> Pedro Viejas over at, at <laughs> he could probably uh, load you up with the piranhas, uh, which they did. He Pedro got them something like twenty or twenty-five red bellies, and and uh, to make the order a full thirty, he put some pacus in there too <laughs> for the show. And anyway, uh, they they sent me the air date of the show, and I watched it. And uh, uh, Teller got into the aquarium, did his little spiel, but what was not seen by the public was that Teller actually got bit by one of the piranhas. After trying to say the whole thing was a myth that he would get bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, see, I had warned him beforehand. Say, look, him going in the aquarium is not going to do anything. They're not going to do anything to him. But if you frighten them and they have nowhere to go, I mean, their mouths are going to be going like that, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> one of them caught his foot. <laughs> oh man, yeah. Oh, but it, it did, that part didn't make it into into the TV show. <laughs> Probably surprised him a little bit there. Yeah, 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 I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. And then let's see. I did some for uh, uh, Jeremy Wade. They, uh, his show, I think it was Discovery Channel. Contact. Yeah. And then, but my my involvement with that show was mostly telling them where they could find piranhas or where they couldn't find any. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a, a little bit of the local legend and stuff. Um, I'm trying to think which other one. I mean, there are so many. I, I don't remember yeah. them all. Well, I, I mean, that's that's really neat, though, that, you know, it's one of those cultural icons of a fish, though. Yeah. Uh, part, you know, and, and because of that, you get to then educate about other types of fish, the ecosystem, you know, the everything with it. So, uh, you know, thank you for doing that. Um, I was wondering if it's okay if we open it up to uh, – questions from from viewers well let me say one more thing okay yeah first of all at the top at the top of my head i can't remember everybody's name but i want to <laughs> thank dr william l fink from the university of michigan he's retired now but he's my mentor antonio machado ellison venezuela he's a good friend and, and i adore him ivan michael j uh brian scott uh yalka and yeah. 
George Fear, so many people that I've met over the years. I mean, I, I thank them from the bottom of my heart for, for being there for me and, and helping me. Oh, okay. One, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, one, 100%. Oh, I guess the last thing, too. So does that Oregon piranha and uh, uh, exotic fish exhibit still exist right now? No, I, I closed it out in 2000, and I turned it over to uh, Rob Caddick from the United Kingdom. Uh, he runs it now. Uh, I think I turned it over to him in uh, 2004, 2006, somewhere in there. Okay. Uh, but I, I do, uh, from time to time, I do advise them, you know, give them a little bit of advice on, on what to do on some of the species. But is it over in the UK now? Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it is now. And not the exhibit, but the archive website is run by him. The exhibit, okay. Uh, the, the exhibit closed out in 2000, and all the specimens, majority of them all went to the different schools nearby and, and up to the University of, uh, of, of Oregon. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's closed out. Yeah, Okay. And I, I only kept I kept only one fish out of that exhibit, and it lived for about 27 years, and it died. I got it right here. I'm going to show them off. Wow, 27 years. Man, that's like a marriage. Yeah, uh, Sarah Sound was brand I don't know if you can see that very well or not on the camera. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, he lived for 27 years, and he was the oldest fish that I that I kept from the exhibit. And wow. A couple years ago, so, yeah. yeah. That's incredible. So if yeah, you know what my you're son, doing. My son Jeremy kept him, uh, kept him for... About the last four years of its life, he did a pretty good job of keeping them alive too. Wow, I mean that's awesome. So we have a lot of people uh, sh saying, you know, we love you, Frank. Good to see you, Frank. <laughs> uh, so you know, it's good to see well, everyone in the. I appreciate them. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see everyone in the chat um, having a good time. Uh, also, the last thing I want to say, so you guys feel free to ask questions in here if you're curious about anything. Uh, just type them up right now, and and I'll start reading them. But uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that your book will be going to uh, the proceeds will be going to further research, uh, conservation, discovery of fellow uh, piranha species. Correct. I mean that that's the that's correct. I, I chose not to to uh, get any money from this book. Wow. And believe me, I had a lot of people talking in my ear. You should get some money. No, no. <laughs> I, I want this to be. I want this to be my you know living legacy. Uh, my contribution, giving back to what was given to me. So, wow, thank I want, you. I want, I wanted to, uh, I want people to learn more. That's that's incredible. That's awesome. And uh, you know, I also want to plug uh, what Yelka and Ivan Mikolji, uh, also another great expert and uh, guy down there in the trenches in Venezuela, in the in the in the jungle, actually, uh, uh, looking at these fish, photos, documenting them. His book's amazing that came out on the Orinoco. But um, we've also, and myself included, have been working on getting together the Green Earth Alliance uh, nonprofit so we can help facilitate projects like this. Um, getting education to the masses and then getting funding to niche pro projects where, you know, your life's work we don't want it to go to goldfish research, no, <laughs> you know? No, no, no. So, so no, no. yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, all right. So does anybody have any questions in there or, or do we have a bunch of piranha experts already hanging out in here? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I could talk your ear off all day, but uh, yeah. Um, let's see here. Somebody says, uh, Alishin says, I remember buying wimples when I was a kid in the 70s. Are they still being exported? Uh, I have no idea. Are, yeah, they are. There's a, uh, there's a place called Avon Fish Box uh, here in Oregon that actually imports them. Uh, you can still get them. You know, they're, it, they're, is that a type of piranha? Uh, well, DNA-wise, it's, it's put in there with the piranhas, but it's not actually a piranha. Uh, it's okay. It's a parasitic fish that feeds on scales, you know. And so oh, it's, okay. It's, it's, it's in there, but not quite. Okay, yeah. So, I'm curious, what would you say, pound for pound, a lot of people have always said, oh, the piranha is the meanest fish. Um, I happen to have an anecdote where... Uh, a friend had a dovi, and uh, amongst dovis, I've also heard um, Haitian, um, the black meanies, or whatever you want to call them, uh, the 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 Haitian cichlid. 
uh, have, but, but my friend Bentley happens to also do YouTube, but he had a dove, I believe it was. And, um, somebody came over to his house in college and put an adult red belly piranha in the tank at a party thinking it would be funny because they would fight and that, that the piranha would win. Well, I guess the dove, I bit it in half. Yeah. Uh, and that was the end of it. There was yeah. no anything. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, there are plenty of mean fish out there that, that, uh, will eat each other and bite other fish in half and so forth. Um, and when it comes down to it, it's size, but pound for pound, I mean, uh, are, are there any other fish like piranha that are interesting to you that are, you know, maybe people would be interested in after, after they, well, yeah, the, the, the hydrocenus is, is one that I that I've, I've enjoyed over the years. Hydrocenus being the African tigerfish. Yeah, is that the uh, and the uh, Goliath? Yeah, is like that a, the Goliath one? Goliath, yeah. Yeah, Both Goliath man. and then Vitatus. But uh, yeah, that one there has got some really gnarly teeth. Uh, I've kept <laughs> them here in the aquariums. They're really nice. Oh wow! Uh, yeah. Wow. So, but yeah, I would recommend those. They're a little bit more delicate than than a piranha is. But you okay. Have to be careful on water quality and making sure it has sufficient uh, filtration. But yeah, the the, the hydrocenus is an awesome fish. I would recommend it. Uh, cool. If you like shock in your life, there's always an African, uh, you know, electric catfish. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I got you know. A few times by them. So. <laughs> I've been really fascinated by the mormorids lately. I've been yeah. keeping those. Um, they don't shock as a weapon, but they use it for navigation and communication. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's fascinating too, how they've evolved. I mean, I was reading piranhas are, they believe 30 million years old uh, uh, is kind of where they diverged from a similar ancestor so, somewhere. Um, and you know, Corydoras are 60 million years old. People forget how old the Amazon really is as a biosphere and what, a I I mean, the, the fact that we need to protect it and discover it and, write down what's there basically uh it's not a trivial thing anymore it's it, there are corners we don't know about there are fish we don't know about so um i just wanted to say that but uh somebody has another question which is um uh uh frank is there uh roger whaley says cousin frank question <laughs> Is there a species that is best for the beginner uh, in the piranha group? I mean, is there something you'd recommend? In the piranha group, I would, if, for a single species, you could probably do Sanchezi, Therosalma Sanchezi, uh, namely because it, it can grow in a small tank. And, you know, it's just a good fish to start with if you want to have a singular species. Uh, if you want to go into the more groups, then you go with the common natterite, the, the red belly piranha. Okay. And so, I mean, is that, um, like, what's the smallest size per piranha species? Is it well, yay big? Yay? Uh, well, the, the smallest one would probably be, be Sanchez I and Irritans. They're both very, pretty close to each other on, on size. Irritans comes from, sorry, sorry, Irritans comes from Venezuela. Uh, they, they're not really in it anymore uh, but they are bringing them in probably through a black market but um, uh, those are the two smallest species and uh, I think the next one follows that would be uh, uh, Calvin eye that's another one that's probably a small species about six seven inches Wow okay and are any of these fish that can live in a community somebody asked about them living with exodons or uh, anything like that um, well, <laughs> yeah I've seen those aquariums uh, yeah. Well, first you have to understand what exodons are. They're essentially a six-inch fish that lives on eating scales and anything <laughs> else that's in the water. Okay, so so you want to think about that first. Uh, that they <laughs> yeah. are scale eaters. Uh, uh, will anything live with a piranha? Yeah, they can live in there for a while. You know, eventually they're going to become lunch. You know. Yeah. Uh, and by a while, that can mean anywhere from a year to two years, or just a few minutes. You know, it depends. Yeah. Uh, it's so not best I would recommend, but people do it, you know. So species tank is probably ideal. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and then somebody has uh, a question. <laughs> Patrick says, uh, "Frank, sorry, but I gotta ask: How many times have you been bitten by piranhas?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
at least once. I'll put it that way. I got close a few other times, but once. Once badly. It. Yeah, it required three stitches. Okay. It, yeah. It, and it was only about a two and a half inch specimen. So again, you have to be very careful with them. Wow. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. What happened was the fish uh, bit through the net, and I instinctively caught it with my hand. No, no, you don't do that. Just let it drop to the floor. But not me. You know, I had to catch it with my hand, and I got bit. So, Man, yeah. I mean, flopping around a fish is hard enough to control, but that's uh, that's nasty. Uh, it's like a little razor blade. You know, we we have another YouTuber friend that I will not, I won't shame him here, but uh, he got bit during a live stream when he was, you know, feeding and talking and multitasking, and uh, it seemed like the the wetness, the blood, the warm feeling is what he noticed before the fact that, like, man, I got damaged, you know. Uh, when when I got bit, my uh, my mother was in the kitchen area, and the aquarium was in the it was in the living room. And I remember netting the fish out, and it bit through the net. And it was my mother that first noticed. You're bleeding, and I said, "What?" <laughs> and then, I, and of course, I saw the blood just pouring out of my hand. And and then maybe moments later, I felt it. I am my God, I have never felt a pain like I like that before. It was the worst <laughs> paper cut ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we had another question was uh, uh, from uh, Lothian Fish Keeper Channel. What's uh, your experience with uh, Pristobri? Uh, I'm going to butcher this. Pristobricon uh, carospinus. 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 Uh, okay. Well, this is where, where people are going to going to learn a little new science. All right. Yeah. The, the genus Pristobrikin is no more. Everything that's that's been in that genus has been moved into Cerasalmus. Uh, and a couple of the species in there, I think three, I think uh, Cardiospinus is one of them. Uh, they're going to be put into a new generic ranking. Uh, they, they haven't come up with a name yet. It's still being examined by the, by the scientists that are working with it. But uh, everything that, that is today Bristobrikin has been moved into Cerasalmus. As far as Caraspinus is concerned, my, my involvement with that species was basically on a paper. I, myself, uh, Antonio Machado, and, and, uh, and uh, Ivan Mickle J, we, we did a coloration uh, description on it on a, on a paper that just came out this year. Uh, as far as the species itself, Ivan probably has the best um, experience with it than, than I ever would because he actually got into the, into the rivers with them and swam around with them. Wow. But, uh, generally, yeah. they're, generally, they're a fruit and insect eating species as far as we know of. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hence the, uh, you know, the same with the Paku and the teeth that look so human, you know, uh, it's, they well, eat. Not necessarily. The teeth are probably a little bit shorter, a little bit flatter, and specialized. Eating nuts and fruits and things like that. Yeah. Taking off the husk primarily. You can okay. see that. Pygo priestess denticulata, where the teeth are, are crinulated. You got that uh, the the four cusps, or one, two, three, four, six cusps. I had to sit there and count it. <laughs> Lost count you got a photographic there. memory where you're you're remembering what you. Yeah, that's that's impressive. Yeah, so yeah, they got they got six uh, small teeth, and and they use it for shearing off the husk of seeds and stuff, and, and devouring it. And you know, I got to tell you a little funny story about that. When I first wrote about that uh, back in the '90s, ODFW thought I was full of baloney. No such thing until I sent them a video of them eating seeds. <laughs> and their baloney, their baloney became something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Uh, you know, the uh, the other thing that I happened to come across was that um, uh, the Smithsonian Institute, of all places, for an exhibit, uh, they, they said that if piranha were to, uh, if three to 500, which is a big range in my mind, if they were to attack a person in a free feeding frenzy, uh, a, a 180 to 200 pound adult male. Uh, it says they assume it would take four to six minutes to strip them completely to the bone uh, with notes uh, on pig carcasses that they uh, have used. Um, but that being said, uh, almost every incident that I've found is people who've had a heart attack or drowned or something like that uh, rather than a living human. I mean, a living human will get out of the water too, as, right, as soon as, right. um, the exponential biting would have started even theoretically. Um, so 
Do we have, I mean, to put it to rest, do we have any official deaths caused by piranha um, notated yet? No. Uh, I've, seen a, I've, seen a, I've read a lot of uh, anecdotes where, where yeah. uh, piranha, a child, for example, was, was eaten by piranhas. Uh, but nothing that, that says that they were actually alive when, when they were attacked. Uh, same thing like that famous uh, the bus accident. The bus accident from what 1977, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I took kind of I took a little bit of issue with Jeremy Wade over what he he put on that Discovery Channel about that, because Ivan Sasima and some I forget who the other who, who the other researcher was researched that bus, and they said that everyone in that bus had drowned before the piranhas came in, and it isn't just the piranhas. You also have a fish called carnero that also goes in there and feeds. As well as all the other fishes, cichlids, you know, other tetras, they'll come in sure. and feed on the remains too. But but uh, but the way Jeremy portrayed it, it was that these people were eaten alive. No, they weren't. They were drowned. So, yeah, they got to build up that tension, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> but demonization. Yes, yes, it's uh, entertainment. But uh, you know, that's so. That's I mean, that's comforting. Uh, do you, do you know if the the local people uh, figured uh, you know? Did a little bit of research beforehand, but they, they call it something like the teeth fish or the scissor fish. It's kind of a rough translation, the biting mouth fish. Yeah, well, the name Piranha uh, is, is a, is a Tupi Guarani hybrid uh, uh, name. It means a tooth fish. Tooth fish, okay. Tooth fish, yeah. So, yeah, All right. It's from the, from the Indian. Yeah. And and they use it to cut hair and all that good stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, they use that as a tool very, very frequently. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, wear, I wear my one right here. I can use it to you know, clean my teeth with, you know. There you go. Yeah. Shave in the morning. Is that how you get that yeah. clean shave? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, all right. Do we have any last question, guys? I mean, thank you so much, Frank, for, for speaking with me. And we'll put links. And as I get more links, if we have new websites or new info, I'll go back and add them to this sure. uh, to this video so that people can use this as a touchstone for your book and uh, and for your website as well. Um, oh, thank you. And uh, yeah, so I mean, but but thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us and dispel a little bit. Talk about, I mean, your legacy. I know we're just touching on it, but if you guys like what you heard today, definitely sign up for. Um, you know, sign up for the alerts on the book and uh, and the uh, Green Earth Alliance projects and things like that. And we will uh, we'll let you guys know what's what's going on. So, yeah. Any any parting words, Frank? I'll let you have the the last word. Well, the last word on this would be that I uh, again a million thanks to all the hobbyists out there that that have helped me throughout the years. Uh, and and it, I, please do not be offended if I couldn't name everybody who I wanted to thank, but those were the general people that have been in my life, you know, other than my wife and, and my children who are number one for me. And, you know, again, I want to thank everybody for, for being out there and supporting me all these years. Right on. Well, that's very humble, a very kind of you. Uh, you know, I'm honored to, to have you uh, share some time with us. And, and uh, I think it'll be great to have all your life's work in that book. I mean, well, condensed life's work yeah. in that book <laughs> i'm sure we could never scratch the sur surface of it all but uh you know thank you so much and uh i guess we're gonna sign off here thank you guys for for watching for listening thank you moderators and people with questions thank you uh, you know i see people like brian and ivan and uh and uh yelka in the chat so uh thank you so much for for joining us here and uh like i said uh, sometimes with Streamyard with the software it doesn't let me pin or do certain things until the video renders and is up, but we'll get those links up within 24 hours and have uh, links to uh, Frank's uh, continued work to the book and to the green earth Alliance nonprofit. Uh, and if you want to help out with that uh, also, there's a landing page there where you can uh, say, I want to volunteer translating. I can do that for free or, I want to, you know, it, just if you need help, I'm from uh, Brazil and I know this or that, or I'm working on a project on such and such. So if you work with freshwater fish in the Orinoco or the Amazon, um, or well, really anywhere that, that, that that's a discovery and or preservation, um, 
check it out, sign in and um, let us know and, and get in contact with the organization. And, uh, you know, the more of us working on these things, uh, the better, as long as we've got a good filter and headmaster to, uh, to decide what's, uh, you know, the wheat from the chaff. So thank you so much for, for being that knowledgeable source and, uh, and all hey, can that. Can one more? Oh, no, not at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, I also want to thank Davida Kidney here in, in Roseburg, all the doctors, Dr. Kumar and all the doctors. Oh, yeah. Uh, they, they, they're, they're a wonderful group of people and, and they're, they can really super good care of me. So I, you know, I'm, right really, on. I'm kind of feeling bad that I almost forgot about them, but I shouldn't forget about them. They're keeping me alive. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm so glad that you are and that you're with us here and working on it and staying invigorated to some degree. I, you know, I have lupus, I have, uh, injuries from a lightning strike. That's a whole other story, but you know, I know what it's like to go through, real trying times being in the hospital and things like that. And, uh, uh, I mean, it's a testament to your will, your fortitude that you push forward with that. And it's, a, it's a real inspiration to those of us, especially, you know, I'm, I'm younger, obviously. Um, but sometimes you feel like, you know, giving up or not working on the things that, that bring light to your life. And, um, really it, it gives a lot back when you put yourself into things like this. And so, uh, you know, thanks for also encouraging people like me um, who could get discouraged from time to time. So thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we, I'll be back on Tuesday uh, for a live show. And uh, stay tuned for the next video on the channel. And uh, like I said, follow the links if you want to know more about all this piranha business uh and can you say it one more time the beautiful accent uh and the proper way to say uh red belly piranha all right it's it's, it's uh, watch this carefully now okay piranha okay roll an r piranha piranha there you I'll, go you i'll work it. on it all right Fair master <laughs> from the best thank you so much all right guys have a great day. Uh, take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.